In Peru, social movements mobilize nationwide, while the general strike advances, demanding a constituted assembly and the freedom of former president Pedro Castillo. Member countries of the Bolivarian Alliance for the Peoples of Our America People's Trade Treaty, ALBA TCP, issued a joint declaration closing the 22nd summit of the regional body in Havana. And the Russian Foreign Ministry, Sergei Lavrov, warned that if the United States delivers sophisticated air defense missiles to Ukraine, Moscow could see it as a new provocation and take action. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is From the South. I'm your anchor, Gladys Quesada. And now we begin with the news. On Thursday, social movements mobilize at national level in Peru, while the general strike advances, demanding a constituted assembly and the freedom of former president Pedro Castillo. Despite the fact that the Peruvian government declared a state of emergency for 30 days in the country, the mobilizations organizers invited the citizens to join the protests. Also, those promoting the national strike indicated they expect massive demonstrations in the regions of La Libertad, Arequipa, Lima, Cusco, and Cajamarca. Since his imprisonment, sectors of Peruvian society have moved to express their support for Castillo and demand his release. Meanwhile, the National Human Rights Coordinator has reported that at least eight people have died as a result of police repression against the protesters. In the meantime, the hearing against former Peruvian President Pedro Castillo continues. The Public Prosecutor's Office has requested 18 months of preventing imprisonment for Castillo and his former Prime Minister, Aníbal Torres, for alleged rebellion crimes. On their request to the court, the prosecution suggested Castillo should be sentenced to at least 10 years in prison for allegedly perpetrating a coup d'etat. The former head of state is currently detained at the police special OPS head quarters, a jail waiting for a verdict to be issued. Now we move on to other topics. Brazil is set to restart diplomatic relations with neighboring Venezuela once President-elect Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva assumes office on January 1, 2023. Mauro Vieira, whom Lula da Silva named last week as his pick for foreign minister, announced that a diplomatic mission will travel to Caracas next month to organize an official Brazilian residence in the city before an ambassador is appointed by Brazil's legislature. Diplomatic relations between Brazil and Venezuela broke down in 2020 during the tenure of Brazil's outgoing president Jair Bolsonaro. President-elect Lula da Silva, who defeated Bolsonaro in the country's October election, has signaled he will, he will seek to ease tensions with his country's northern neighbor. The government delegation headed by President Simora Castro will sign on Thursday a memorandum of understanding with the United Nations for the installation of an international commission against corruption and impunity in Honduras. The Honduran president, Xiomara Castro, and the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres met to agree on some elements and steps to follow with this mechanism. It is defined that during the first quarter of 2023, both parties will define the sources of financing for the Commission, with the support of the international community. According to official sources, with this memorandum, one of the president's campaign promises to confront the inherited corruption is about to be fulfilled. And the workers grouped in the Uruguayan Banking Union went on a partial strike in protest against the proposed reform of the country's retirement and pension system.
The officials ensure or assured that if the reform suggested by the government is passed, they will lose the achievements of the last few years. In the same manner, the demonstrators express that they will continue to defend the bank, pension and retirement fund against the reform project. In this sense, several banking and financial institutions in the Aguada and Cordon neighborhoods were affected by the strike. This is the third day of mobilization that we're carrying out in rejection of a social security reform and in defense of the bank fund. We are facing a reform that means working more years and getting less retirement for the vast majority of the workers. It means that society will now have to put money to finance the passage of workers from the fund to the state, an amount that will exceed $6 billion that will have to be paid by the entire population and at the same time, it is a reform that does not solve any of the problems that the bank fund has. This is why we are involved in promoting other elements for the social security reform and at the same time we are defending our institution. With the support of the Pan-American Health Organization, Haiti received around 1.2 million doses of oral cholera vaccines as cases continue to rise in the country. The vaccine, Elvichol, was provided by the International Coordinating Group of Vaccine Provision, which manages the global cholera vaccine stockpile following a request by Haiti's Ministry of Public Health and Population. The country's vaccination campaign is set to begin in the next days, initially targeting populations over the age of one year in Sid du Soleil, Dolmas, Tabar, Carrefour and Port-au-Prince, areas in which most of the cholera cases have been reported to date. Let's take a short break, but first, remember you can follow us on our TikTok account at Dallas with English, in which you will be able to see news in different formats, news updates, and more. Other studies coming up, stay with us. Welcome back. On Wednesday, member countries of Bolivarian Alliance for the Peoples of Our Americas People's Trade Treaty, ALBA TCP, issued a joint declaration closing the 22nd summit of the regional body in Havana. The summit closed with the declaration ratifying its strengthening and rejecting the attacks against the progressive leaders of Peru, Nicaragua, Bolivia and Argentina. Alba TCP, heads of state and government and other delegations also welcomed the signing of the partial agreement for the protection of the Venezuelan people. The peace talks between the government of Colombia and the ELN called for international solidarity for Haiti. the region. And on Wednesday, Venezuela's ambassador to Colombia, Felix Plasencia, was appointed executive secretary of the Bolivarian Alliance for the Peoples of Our America People's Trade Treaty at the 22nd summit of the heads of state and government held in Havana, Cuba. The diplomat will replace former Bolivian minister Sasha Llorenti, who congratulated his colleague on his new appointment through his Twitter account and wished him every success on his new role. The meeting took place on the occasion of the 18th anniversary of the Summit of Heads of State and Government of Alba TCP held at the Palace of the Revolution. During this event, representatives of the member countries met and highlighted the organization's key role in regional integration. Now we address other topics. On Thursday, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov warned that if the United States confirms to deliver sophisticated air defense missiles to Ukraine, it will mark yet another provocation that could prompt a response from Moscow. 
Ministry spokesperson Maria Zaharova said that the U.S. has become a party to the conflict in Ukraine, following reports that the American country intended to provide Kiev with Patriot air surface-to-air missiles. Zaharova also said that the increased transfer of such sophisticated weapons will mean greater involvement of military personnel in hostilities and could have consequences. U.S. officials said Washington was about to approve the sending of the missiles, acceding to a request from Ukrainian authorities for the more robust weapons to shoot down Russian missiles. Washington has effectively become a party to the conflict on a practical level, given the growing amounts of direct U.S. military assistance, including the presence of U.S. servicemen on the ground. The transfer of such sophisticated weapons requiring months of training would mean even broader involvement of U.S. military personnel in the hostilities and could entail possible consequences. The Russian spokesperson warned that any weapons supplied by the United States or other countries to Ukraine will be a target to be destroyed by the Russian armed forces. We strongly advise those who make decisions in Washington to finally listen, perhaps not to us, but to themselves, and draw the right conclusion from our repeated warnings that any weapons system supplied to Ukraine, including the Patriot, along with the personal service in them, are and will remain legitimate priority goals for the Russian armed forces. And we remain on this topic. Ukrainian forces shelled the center of the Russian city of Donetsk early on Thursday morning. Kyiv troops fired 40 shells damaging civilian facilities, including residential buildings, a cathedral and a kindergarten. From the Donetsk People's Republic, data report that the Kyiv military fired 40 times with multiple grad rocket systems. The mayor of the city, Alexei Klemzin, stated that Kyiv subjected the center of Donetsk to the most massive, massive attack since 2014. The attack left one dead and nine injured, including a child. Authorities report that people were trapped under the debris of a residential building hit by a projectile. Some shells hit residential premises and there were also impacts on a kindergarten, shattering the windows and the doors. In Belgium, European Parliament President Roberta Metzola announced a sweeping reform of the control mechanisms within the legislative body in response to the scandal that led to the arrest of an influential Greek MEP. After Europe speaking at the European Union's summit, Medzola said that the comprehensive reform package should be ready by the new year. According to the Parliament President, the initiative includes the strengthening of whistleblower protection systems, as well as a ban on access to all unofficial friendship groups and a review of the Code of Conduct rules. There will also be a complete review of third countries' interaction with the European Parliament. and four migrants died after a boat got into difficulties and capsized in the English Channel. Authorities confirmed the information after a major search and rescue operations was launched early on Thursday. The United Kingdom's Southeast Coast Ambulance Service sent resources to Dover, England, after receiving a call regarding the incident. British Home Secretary Suella Braverman declined to comment on the number of people in the boat and the number of rescued in the joint UK-France operation, which involved resources from the UK's Royal National Lifeboat Institution, the British Royal Navy, Border Force, the French Navy and Kent Police. And we have more news coming up after a final short break, so stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. On Tuesday, Fiji held general elections, where 55 members of parliament will be elected out of a pool of more than 300 candidates. According to the country's electoral system, each candidate must obtain at least 5% of the total votes casted in order to obtain a parliamentary seat. 
The leader of the party with most seats will serve as new prime minister and form a cabinet. More than 6 million Fijians across the country voted in this year's general election, and more than 800 polling stations were open to the voters. Election supervisor Mohamed Zanim said the electoral authorities took a series of measures to ensure fairness and transparency in the polls. The results will be announced in four to five days. In India, at least 31 people have died and 20 others have been hospitalized in serious conditions after allegedly drinking tainted liquor sold without authorization. Police officers confirmed several of the 20 hospitalized have lost their eyesight. The victims belong to the three villages in Bihar state where the manufacturing, sale and consumption of liquor are prohibited. Such bans are enforced in several Indian states, driving a thriving black market for cheap alcohol made in unregulated distilleries and that kills hundreds of people yearly. The sale and consumption of liquor were prohibited in Bihar state in 2016 after women's groups campaigned against poor workers spending their low incomes on drinking. The deaths were reported in a government-run hospital where their families brought the sick for treatment. On Lebanon's divided parliament failed to elect a new president for a tenth time, despite the damage the political deadlock is going to and doing to efforts to bail out its bankrupt economy. Parliament is currently split between supporters of the Hezbollah movement and its opponents, neither of whom have a clear majority. Hezbollah opponent Mikhail Mouad, son of former president Rene Mouad, won the support of 38 members of parliament, but once again fell well short of the required majority. Only 109 out of parliament's 128 lawmakers showed up for the vote. Furthermore, 37 blank votes were casted, and eight members of parliament voted for prominent historian and academic Hizam Kaliyev. Culture plays a decisive role in the progress of nations, a reality on the basis of which Damascus organized this Wednesday, December 14th, the first conference on creative industries with a view to boosting creativity and cultural innovation. From Damascus, our correspondent with the details. The more flawless the product, the more creative it will be, and it will have a greater expansion and impact so that it can go beyond the limits of abstract intellectual and artistic creativity to become part of the industrial world and become one of the drivers of sustainable development and an important pillar of economic and social development. This is the main objective of the first conference of creative industries that Syria needs so badly in the midst of the current economic crisis that is suffering due to the war and the blockade. Creative industries help to create new job opportunities and consequently increase the income of Syrian families, which will have a positive effect on the local development process in the different provinces of the country, thereby improving the economic parameters of the national economy. With this conference, we seek to reach a roadmap to boost the creative industries in the public and private sectors, since the creative industry does not fall solely on the state sector but requires joining the efforts of all sectors and all those who work in the field of creativity for the benefit of the country's progress at the political, economic and social levels. Creative industries are an essential part of a cultural sector and include areas such as music in its different branches, publishing, traditional and historical handicrafts, the film industry and design, among others. These fields that show numerous cases of individual creativity in Syria and that the authorities of Damascus with this conference seek to create the ideal conditions to organize, optimize and commercialize their work at the local, regional and international levels for the benefit of the economic and social development of the country. Our main objective of this first meeting on creative industries is to highlight the importance of embracing and supporting individual creativity and to create an environment of collective creativity that supports the national economy. Creativity depends mainly on the innovative action of a human being, and this is precisely what we want to promote and develop in order to contribute to the reconstruction of what terrorism has destroyed during the war years, 
and to move towards a better future for the new generations. Any creativity case needs backup. And this backup involves ensuring the necessary capital so that these cases can turn their creativity into products that satisfy both local and global demand and help advance the development process of society and the country as a whole. This conference, although it happens to be the first of its kind in the country, is not the first step taken by Syria in this field. Damascus has always backed and encouraged creative, talented and outstanding individuals. Individuals who, with their innovative minds, it is confident that they will be able to overcome the difficulties caused by the Western economic blockade and play an important role in the new cultural, scientific, economic and social upsurge of their country after long years of war. And just as the hearts of millions of fans live the emotions of the Qatar 2022 World Cup, Telesur joins this sporting event with From the Field, a show that brings news, analysis, reviews and more to our audience. Don't miss it. Our show airs 1 p.m. local time in Caracas and 12 p.m. New York. Remember, From the Field, only on Telesur. And we have come to the end of this news brief. But remember, you can find this and many other stories on our website at telesurienglish.net. And also, if you feel so inclined, please join us on social media for all the latest news. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Telegram, and TikTok. For Telesur English, I'm Gladys Quesada. Thank you for watching.